Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Stewart coming to you again from Mission Hill Baptist Church in Hayesville, North Carolina. I'm up here in the Fellowship Hall uh, right now and uh, doing some Bible studies, and we want to try to uh, bring you another Bible study out of Romans chapter number one. Uh, we finished up Romans one uh, through six and uh, seven, of course. Verse seven was... Uh, um, uh, of course, just that introduction to all that be at Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his uh, uh, introduction to them. And uh, verse number eight, he says uh, in chapter one of Romans, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Now, I want to stop right there and and say, when he says first, he had a lot of things on his agenda that he wanted to speak to those that were at Rome, a lot of things that he wanted to clear up, uh, doctrines that he wanted to bring to them, uh, issues that he wanted to deal with, things that he wanted to explain to them. And the first thing that he wanted them to know the very first thing was that he thanked God for them. And he thanked God. He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Now, I know that may seem simple, but uh, all things that we come to God with, will uh, we, we go through Jesus Christ. They would not be possible without God's Son. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. And he says, I thank my God. How do I thank God? Through Jesus Christ. I thank him through Jesus Christ. Uh, apart from Christ, Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. There are a lot of people that say, well, I believe in God. I just don't believe in Jesus. There's no way possible that you can approach God in any way, not even to thank him properly unless you do that through Jesus Christ. So Paul made it clear. He said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Paul wanted them to know, that, I mean, there, there was a lot of idolaters at Rome. There were many gods uh, that the people of Rome had worshiped. And he wanted them to know the way to the true and the living God was one way and that was through Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. I thank God for all of you, he said, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Their faith, their trust in Christ, uh, that of all the places that they could have lived right there in the heart of Rome. Now, we're talking about in the day of Roman rule, and they had, uh, you know, been very hard on uh, the Jewish people. And then, of course, the Christians uh, that followed Christ, they were, they were, you know, very, very hard upon them. And here these believers were right in the heart of Rome, and they had assembled themselves together as a church. They had put their faith in Christ to live uh you know, of all places, probably the hardest place to live. There's nowhere in the world uh, that a person can't be saved. You can be saved regardless of where you live in this world. You can live for Christ regardless of where you live, of the government around you, uh, of the threat that they may pose. Uh, these believers their faith had been spoken of throughout the whole world. And uh, you know, Paul, of course, uh, we believe if you search and reference the scripture, he's talking about the known world at that time, all cities known, uh, those in Asia Minor, those in Egypt, those in uh, the Middle East, uh, those across Europe. The, known, the whole known world had heard of the faith 
of these Roman believers. And uh, so it was spoken of throughout the whole world. Our testimony can travel great distances. How we stand for Christ, what we do for the Lord can have great impact on people clear around the world. Uh, it just, uh, look at, look at the, what the Apostle Paul is saying to them here. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Can you imagine uh, that one small group of believers that uh, all believers everywhere around the known world today was talking about that one significant group? That's the way it was that Paul said, I thank God for you all. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. He's trying to encourage them, edify them, to build them up, to be a strength to them, knowing what a blessing that their faith had been to other people. He said, for God is my witness. Now, uh, Paul says this on different occasions, uh, that, that God was his witness. He uh, spoke, I believe it was uh, in Romans chapter number 9 or 10, he talked about God being his witness and his holy angels uh, bearing witness to the truth that Paul was speaking. Paul the apostle knew that God was his witness, that God was witnessing everything that Paul was saying, all that Paul was doing. He said, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Think about that in light of what he said in Romans chapter number six and Romans chapter number seven the spirit life, and then the flesh life that had failed him in Romans chapter 7. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 1, what he spoke there. And he said, whom I serve, I serve God with my spirit. How much of our service is done, really, through the strength of our flesh, whether or not we can go or not, whether or not we have the strength or the ability to uh, get our bodies up off the couch and go down the road to do something. But Paul said, my service to him, I serve with my spirit. He didn't give any benefit to the flesh. The flesh was not involved in his service to the Lord because the flesh, the arm of the flesh will fail you. And he said, we can have no confidence in the flesh. But he said, I serve with my spirit. And I think it would help us as believers to really see the difference that our service to the Lord, our true service to the Lord is done through our spirit, not through our flesh. Many a time we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well, I feel good about what I've done. And we're looking at that flesh. We need to look in the inner man, the spiritual man. He's the one that's doing the service. If there's any desire, it's going to come from him. It's not going to come from the flesh. If there's any living for the Lord, it's going to come through the inward man your outward man is certainly not going to want to live for the Lord, not going to want to do anything for the Lord. He's going to be the one that will always give you the excuse. But Paul said, I, my, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. I serve God with my spirit. And, uh, and of course, the body is involved. It carries. It is our temple. We should cleanse this temple, that it would be a, a, a temple for the spirit and the soul that dwells within it. It is the temple of God, which is in us. It is. And think about that. Uh, it is supposed to be that shell, that temple that houses that which is alive, that which is on fire, 
that where the sacrifice is, that uh, where the blood is, that where God dwells. You think about the temple and the service of God and how that all of that took place in the days of the tabernacle or even in the days uh, of the temple, Solomon's temple. That shell was uh, of the temple, you know, that was built and it was given to the Lord. It was dedicated to the Lord, but the real service took place on the inside. But Paul said, I serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his son. There's where my service is. It, my service is in the gospel of his son. That's where my service is. We talked about that the last time. That without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, what Paul was saying was, when I pray, I always pray for you. That's what he said without ceasing. He didn't mean from morning, all day, all night to the next morning. I mean, where would he ever eat? Where would he ever drink water? Where would he ever get any sleep? He's not saying without ceasing every second of the day and night, but he's saying without ceasing, when I pray in my prayer life, I pray for you. I never fail to mention you in my prayer. Uh, was it the prophet uh, that said, uh, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you? Maybe the Apostle Paul was thinking about that when he thought about these Roman believers living there in Rome, how much that he knew they needed prayer. They needed somebody to go to God on their behalf. We should see the condition of our brothers and sisters in Christ and what they're facing. Even if we don't know, the Spirit of God knows, and we should pray for them. We should pray for them. We pray for those that we know about. But what about all of God's people around the world, wherever they are? I try to make mention of them often in my prayers. The Lord knows who they are. The Lord knows where they are, and God knows what they're going through. I couldn't even begin to imagine what some of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are going through in the day and the time that we're living in, especially in some of the places in this world that are not as friendly toward the church and Christian believers as here in America. But there he said, I make mention of you always in my prayers, my prayers, my prayers. Can you imagine the weight of the Apostle Paul's prayers? My prayers. My prayers were not simple prayers. My prayers, no doubt he, he had weighty prayers. No doubt this man knew how to come before God through Christ. He knew it was through Christ, and only through Christ. But I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests. And I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul is saying here. I'm making requests. I'm not making any demands. I'm making my requests if by any means, now at length, that's how he's praying. God, if there's any means, if there's any way at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. In other words, he was prayed and made a request. God, if it would be your will, could I come to them? Lord, would you make my journey prosperous? When Paul prayed, he prayed, and he wasn't sure that God would let him go. Why? Because there were times God did not let him go to certain places. It wasn't the will of God at the time. And I think Paul realized how important it was to do things on God's time and in God's way and in the manner that God would have him to do it. And he prayed that way. He said, 
making request. When we pray, that's what we're doing. We're making requests. We're not making demands. And that's not saying that we have lack of faith when we make requests. Sometimes we don't know exactly what God's will will be. But we should make that request. Yet if there's any means at length, God, if there's any way possible that I might have a prosperous journey, that it would be by the will of God to come unto you. Three things just in his journey to go see them that he made that request that God would let him go, that it would be a prosperous journey. He wouldn't have any trouble on the way that God give traveling grace. We pray that today. Well, that's Paul saying, I might have a prosperous journey, that I might have traveling grace, traveling mercy by the will of God. That's important to come unto you. For I long to see you. Paul said, I long to see you. There's something deep within me that is longing to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. He wasn't just wanting to come there to eat the Roman cuisine. The Apostle Paul said, the reason that I want to come see you is I want to give you something. I hope that God would let me impart to you some spiritual gift. I wonder when we connect with one another as believers, if we're trying to help one another's spiritual life in some way, impact our spiritual life one to another, that we'd give something to one another that would stick with that believer, that would be a help to them. I can remember many things that my granddaddy imparted to me as a man of God and as a Christian, as a believer, spiritual things that stayed with me even to this day. And I hope and I pray that I could impart some spiritual gift, make an impact on their life. Uh, those that are around me now, Paul said, I want to impart to you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. This is the reason. Not that you would say, well, uh, that Paul, he, you know, look what, no, what Paul wanted for them was just to know that he would not have to worry about them, that they would be established. He said, to the end, you may be established. If there's one thing that I think believers that have a true desire to be a benefit to other believers they have in their heart, the one thing they want to see is that other believer established. We don't want to see them wobbling, carried away by every wind of doctrine. Paul said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth, that they're established. I can't think of anything greater that I would want from my family that, that they would be established. For the believers here in the church, that they would be established. Established in the faith. Established in this book. Established in the gospel. Established as a believer, as a child of God, as a Christian. To know how to live for Christ. When I'm gone, when I'm not pastor, when, I, when dad's not around anymore, that they would know how to live for the Lord, that they would know how to pray, that they would know how to walk with God and seek the Lord. That's what Paul's saying to these, that you may be established. I thought I was going to get a little further today, but we'll bring this to the end right now, and we'll pick up next time in Romans chapter 1. May the Lord bless you.